Amen. Technology can be used for good or bad. I saw in the news where they just arrested 26 people in Jacksonville, I guess it's Jacksonville, Florida, for soliciting sex with children. Oh, yeah. One of them was a uh, ex-baseball uh, player, professional baseball player. One of them was a sheriff. And one of them was an uh, army uh, sergeant. And on it goes. Mm -hmm. And uh, law's good at uh, uh, making stings like that, boy. Amen. Got them. What they need, law will do its job, but they need the Lord. That's what they need. They need the heart changed. Well, good to be here. Uh, I want to read a scripture for you tonight that I learned at Beaumont Grammar School uh, when I went to a long time ago when I was in grammar school. And uh, we used to read the Bible and pray and salute the flag and, and you know, and, and go through the Pledge of Allegiance. And we had a picture of George Washington on the wall, Abraham Lincoln, and, and some of the other presidents. And uh, they taught us patriotism. And uh, we just had Memorial Day. When I was a kid, they used to call it Decoration Day. We'd go to the graveyard, Ballard's Chapel, and uh, the food would be spread out far as from here, that building up there. And my little brother and I, we'd go from one end of that thing to the other, buddy. I mean, we loaded ourselves up with banana pudding and everything else, and it was sun. I mean, I looked forward to Decoration Day. Then they changed it to Memorial Day, which is fine, to memorialize those who've given their life for this country and uh, to show respect for them, which is well due. Listen, you will never do too much for a, vet, for a veteran. I am 1,000% in support of the veterans. Make no mistake about that. But just a few weeks ago, I heard, I heard a, I think it was a 101, 101 year old veteran, I told you about him. He hit the beach at Normandy, 1944, June the 6th, and uh, hazarded his life, and he made it. A lot of his friends didn't make it, and they died on that beach, young men. They charged into the machine gun fire, showed great courage, showed great courage. There's a huge cemetery there now in Normandy, France. If you ever see it, if you ever see it, General Eisenhower went over there and gave a speech, and others have. But I thought to myself, those men did not die for wokeism. They didn't die for transgenderism. You can't have it both ways. Don't tell me it's Memorial Day when you mock what they died for. The America they died for uh, 75, 80 years ago is long since passed. And I'm sure a lot of these old veterans are grieving right now. The way to show honor to the veterans, folks, is to, is to honor their beliefs and respect what they, what they stood for. Even me, no longer ago than I was in there in 1964, I went in the military. It hadn't changed that much. It was still pretty close to what it was in World War II. The fact of the matter is, a lot of the things I used at the beginning of my time in the Marine Corps were definitely from World War II, <laughs> and no question about it. But it's changed since then. What I'm reading to you tonight, the 23rd Psalm, the 23rd Psalm was written 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago. Now, this is one of the reasons I believe the Bible. Folks, this could be, this is just as relevant today as it was then. So what does that mean? That means people haven't changed. That means people are the same today as they were then. Cultures change. You're going through birth pains in America. I hate to say this tonight, but you're probably going to see some, you're going to see some things happen probably that uh, uh, may not be prepared for. There's an element in this country that is very angry with wokeism and this misgendering people. People are losing their jobs because they misgender someone. So the 23rd Psalm is a Psalm of David. And when I was at Beaumont Grammar School, we read it like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 
Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I've got a fairly good-sized library. I've got uh, quite a few books scattered over <laughs> different places. I've read a lot of them. I've read a lot the few years I've been on this earth. I've read a lot. I've never read anything in my life that's more beautiful than what you just read right there. No way. Nothing Shakespeare ever wrote, and I've read a good bit of Shakespeare. Nothing he ever wrote is any more beautiful than that. The 23rd Psalm is one of the most beautiful scriptures in the world. It's something, and they wanted us to memorize it at Beaumont Grammar School. They thought it would be a good thing for us. Of course it was. I never one time ever worried when I went to Beaumont Grammar School to have my brains blown out. Went to Rural High School, never worried about somebody coming in, knock the door down, shoot us to death. Never happened. Never happened. Never happened. I read a story about uh, World War II when they were, the train would uh, run behind a church. And that train would be carrying the uh, Jews and uh, others to Treblinka and Buchenwald and Belsen Belsen and Auschwitz and, and the rest of these uh, uh, concentration camps to take them in there and gas them to death, get rid of them. The final solution, Hitler called it. But when the train would come by, the people inside the church would be singing. And the song leader would hear that train coming, and he didn't want the people to hear it. He thought he'd do something to kind of, you know, a train can be loud. And so to distract their attention from the train going by, he had them sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. That's what they did. And so that's what the church is doing tonight, singing a little louder while your culture goes to hell all around you. You see, I've lived too long for it, folks. You younger people, you haven't seen the change that I've seen. It's unbelievable. Do you know what's coming up in June, don't you? You know what's coming? A whole month dedicated to it, a solid month in this nation. Wouldn't it be something if they gave a month to the veterans? That'd be wonderful. Say, say one week for the Marine Corps, one week for the Air Force, one week for the Army, one week for the Navy. You know, that'd be, that'd be good, wouldn't you think? Yeah. No, no, no veteran should languish in this nation. No veteran should have to worry about where his next meal's going to come from. No, shouldn't happen. Shouldn't happen. And yet uh, they can come across the border in the south, and they'll put them up in the finest hotels in New York City and call them sanctuary cities. Does that bother you? I mean, really, does that, God's been good to me. I'm not living under the street, uh, you know, under the, under, the, under the interstate out here, out in the woods in the ditch somewhere. He's been good to me. But there's a lot of them, my generation, that they don't have a dime. They're staggering around on the street with nothing. There's something bad wrong here. It's time for a change, don't you think? Amen. I think it's time for a change. And uh, I know one thing. I know the Lord, if you ever get him in your life, He'll change your life. He changed mine. I more than likely wouldn't be alive tonight if the Lord hadn't saved me in 1973. And everybody doesn't uh, get saved the same way, and I know that. But when he came to me, man, he, did he ever shake my world up? Did he ever get my attention? And this is one of the things that gives me hope for people because I pray for people that seem to be hopeless. And I'm sure I was hopeless. I had people give me tracts before I got saved. And the reason they were giving me tracts is because I was ungodly. I mean, I was ungodly. I had a filthy mouth, a filthy heart. I lived a filthy life. I didn't know the Lord, didn't care anything about God. Didn't, didn't even try to put on a show. I didn't care. I played pinball machine while they were having church at Third Creek. I'd go over to the pinball and play pinball machine. Didn't care anything about Third Creek Baptist Church, Bill Cardwell and the preaching down there. Didn't care anything about that until I got saved. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. So if the Lord is your shepherd tonight, you can be thankful. He's my shepherd. Yes, he is. He's my shepherd. And so he said he is. You know, there's an idle shepherd in the book of Zechariah. I'm afraid that idle shepherd now is, is more loved than the true shepherd. He said, I shall not want. Want means that I'll be in need. That's what want means here, not the way we more normally use it today. I want this, want that. And that's not essentially the basic meaning of the word. The word means I have need of something. So he said, I will have no want. 
He'll supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. But God's done more for all of us in this house tonight. How many, of in, how many in, in here would you be honest with God and say, yes, God has given me more than my needs? Amen. Amen. Folks, I'm the first one. I'll raise my hand high. Did you know I've thrown away more than my grandfather ever had in his life? I have. I have. I've thrown away more than he ever had in his life. I have. Isn't that something? And yet, has it drawn us closer to the Lord or further away? Stuff gets in the way, doesn't it? When notice what he said, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He forces me. Sometimes he'll force you apart. Sometimes he'll, you know, when, they, when, uh, when, the, when, when he gave the, uh, when they gave him the bread and the fishes, what did he do with them? He broke them. Anything that he ever uses, he always breaks. He breaks it. And sometimes he has to break our will. We think that we're serving God, but we find out when he really gets a hold of us and breaks that will, uh, there's an awful lot he could say to us, but he can't say it yet because you, have it, you, can't, you don't have ears to hear. And, but he'll put you in a situation where you can. So he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And the point is, to feed us, he leadeth me beside the still waters. There's an old Latin proverb. It says, still waters run deep. Now, you think about this. How many of you have ever been to a shallow river or a creek or something, and you've watched the water as it goes across the rocks? Well, what does that tell you? It ripples. Does that do you think that's 50 feet deep or <laughs> six inches deep in some places? Sure. It's shallow. It's very shallow. And shallow water makes a lot of racket. Yeah. And that's why they say an empty wagon is the one who rattles more than one that's full. <laughs> and you can could, you could make the analogy on that. Still waters run deep, and they can go very deep. Now here is, this is a, uh, this is a take on that. The phrase still waters run deep is used to say that people with shy, reserved dispositions are often very profound and passionate and intelligent underneath their calm, quiet demeanors with many interesting ideas and thoughts the placid manner hides a subtle nature or a complexity that is not immediately clear and obvious. In other words, the phrase describes people who have more going on internally than is apparently that is apparent externally. That's true. That's true. A person who wants attention needs attention. You know that? If they want attention, they need attention because they're very weak individuals. That's right, because they, they, want, they, want they want this approval from the people. They're trying to please people all the time. The, the, the bottom line is they want to be accepted. And if you're the kind of person who always wants to be accepted by the people around you, you won't be accepted by any of them because they'll see that weakness in you. The Lord Jesus takes you regardless of your weakness and your strength. Come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and learn of me. Take my yoke upon you, for I'm meek and lowly of, and lowly of heart. You shall find rest for your souls. You don't have to please the Lord to come to him. Just as I am, Charlotte Elliott said. Men have, a, have their own system of measurements, their own rules, their own guides, their own, their own system of worth. And none of that, none of that uh, is God's value. God made you as an individual. There is nobody else that has ever lived or ever will live just like you. And in some cases, thank God, amen. <laughs> But that's the truth. You're the only one of your kind. Isn't that amazing? And there are, what, 7,000 million alive right now? A bunch of people out there. And you're the only one of your kind. What does that mean? That means the hand of the Creator brought you into existence. That's what that means. He has a reason for your living. And happy is the man who finds out why he's here. He doesn't need that approval from men. Now, he said he leadeth me beside the still waters. You know a sheep will not get next to running water, and the reason it won't is because its fleece, if it gets soaked, gets wet, can pull it under, and it can drown. Fact is, you know, you've seen a cast sheep. I told you about that, where they, for some reason or another, they fall and their legs are sticking straight up in the air. You'd think they could get out of that, but they can't. I watched a man on YouTube the other day. He's a preacher. He has no arms. He has no legs. He was born that way. No arms, no legs. That's sad, isn't it? But he's not sad. 
But I watched him as he lay flat on the, fl flat on the floor. I watched him pick himself up and come up to a microphone and come up into that camera. And he came up off of that floor with no legs and no arms. So he could easily have flipped himself if he wanted to. In other words, he would, you'll never find him cast on his back. Of course, he has no legs to stick straight up in the air. But in plain words, God's given him survival skills. See? But the sheep, the poor sheep, he said, he leadeth me beside the still waters. But then he restoreth my soul. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. We live in a push-button society. You think one trip to the altar and have a good, good, good prayer, you know, cry a little bit and everything's going to be just fine. No, that's just the beginning. A lot of times the, deep, the hurt goes much deeper than you think and you've got to heal. And it takes a while to heal. When my cardiologist did this last ablation, the next day or two my heart was still jumping around here and there. And I thought, man, she messed me up. And it's called, it's called uh, uh, what's the term for it? Uh, oh, I can't remember it now. But your heart's jumping, and it's not in rhythm. And then it will go back in rhythm. Then it starts jump Palpitations, that's the word, palpitations. It would jump around, and then it would go back into rhythm. Then it'd jump around, go back into rhythm. And, uh, and so I called him. And, uh, because the last time it did that, it wasn't like that. And here's what they said. They said, your heart is healing because... I was in surgery for four hours. Your heart is healing. And it takes that heart a, 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 a period of time to heal. And while it's healing, nothing's going to be exactly the way it should be. And so just bear with it and give it time. Well, that's good enough for me because I've got an outstanding cardiologist. I trust her. Rashmi Hadaguter. If you need one, that's, that's the lady. Plug into her. She knows what she's doing. She's an Indian. And she's very smart. Rashmi Hadaguter. But anyway, over a period of a few weeks, my heart started calming down. It wasn't jumping around like it had been. And now, uh, tonight, I haven't noticed it jump any in the last few months, as a matter of fact. Uh, it healed. And I suppose it may still be healing, for that matter. But sometimes your spirit jumps around like that, doesn't it? Yeah, the inside, you've been hurt, and it takes a while to heal. And you can't force healing. You can put Band-Aids on it. You can treat it with medication, this therapy, and so forth and so on. But you're not going to speed up the healing process. It's going to take time to heal. Give God the time it takes to restore your soul. Amen. If any man knew what it meant to have his soul restored, it was David. He said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And I suppose that's probably the last thing to be restored is, is the joy. Because he'll fellowship, he'll restore immediately and communion with God. But it takes a while to get that joy back. A lot of Christians, I don't know if they ever really know what a joy is, but the Apostle Peter said that the trying of your patience is much more precious than of gold that rejoices. You joy, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's a rejoicing in the Lord. That's joy. Amen. That's, that's the kind of thing that's yours. The uh, world doesn't have that. But he makes me to lie down. Here's what he said in the New Testament in his prayer. He said, He lead us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Then he said again, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We have no continuing city here, folks. We don't put roots down here. We're not, we're not citizens. We're citizens of above. Yeah, our citizenship is in heaven. We look for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It wasn't created here. It wasn't made by man. Now, the one that shows up in Revelation is 1,500 miles cube, every direction. It's a cube, 1,500 miles. That's a big city. Yes, walls of jasper, jasper, gates of pearl, streets of pure, transparent gold. There will be some place in there that he's got set aside for me. He said, I go, and he said, I go to prepare a place for you. But if I go, I'll come again to receive into myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He'll slow you down. That's what he'll do. Then he'll lead you beside the still waters. And still waters run deep. The person on the outside who may appear not to be part of what's going on may be deeper in what's going on than you are. <laughs> uh, truly, you can't judge a book by its cover, can you? 
You really can't. I bought, I, 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 I bought into it. I have, I confess. I see a book on the shelf. I used to go to the bookstores all the time, wore myself out with books. Man, there's a nice looking book. Good night. What a cover. They had some artist that did that. This thing's got to be good. Get it home. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. <laughs> it takes you a while to, after you've gone through enough books, to pick one up. And in five minutes, you know if you've got a jewel or just a, you know, bunch of fluff. And uh, folks, let me tell you something. There's a lot of good stuff out there written by Christians that glorify Christ. And the vast majority, not all of it, but the vast majority of it is 100, 200, 300 years old. Don't ever be fooled. The old stuff is the good stuff. Yes, it is. It's the good stuff. The old books. That's the good stuff. The Bible said in Psalm 42, verse 7, Deep calleth unto deep, at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and billows are gone over me. God will take you as deep as you want to go with him. He will. He will. He said in this prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He said, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. He said, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they may, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. That's right. And that's exactly how the nations of the earth judge themselves, is by their military might. And that's where it stands today. Military power. That's what matters. The ability to, to defend themselves and project, uh, to project strength. But that's not my world. That's not my world. My world is deep, calling into deep. He said he restores my soul, and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Did you know the Lord Jesus, when he started out his prayer in Matthew chapter number six, he said, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. He said, all right, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So if your heart is just pumping out constantly, blaspheming against the name of the Lord Jesus and against the name of God, you can be certain there's a big problem going on there now. There's a big problem. Big, 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 big problem. He said, hallowed be thy name. <coughs> now let me tell you one more time, because you might not have gotten what I said the other day. Hebrew consonants, you know, like, uh, like, a, like English consonants, A, E, I, O, U, sometimes Y and W, these are the vowels. All right, you have to have a vowel to, to create a word. You don't know how to pronounce it. Well, in Hebrew, they don't have any vowels. No vowels. Not a single vowel in the whole Old Testament. Not a one. But they've got Masoretic vowel points, little dots and little dashes. And these were put in there by the Masoretes. It was a group of Jews on the western shore of the, of the Sea of Galilee. They had, a, they had, their, they had their little uh, place of uh, worship and study there. They were also connected with the uh, Palestinian Talmud. And these, these Masoretic Jews took these Old Testament uh, consonants and they put vowel points on them so that you could pronounce them. All right? So you could pronounce them. And so when they came to the Tetragrammaton, which is the holy name of God, the consonants are Yod, He, Vow, He. All right? Well, they put vowel points under there from Adonai. They took the pronunciation of Adonai, took the vowel points, and they put Yehovah. We say in English, Jehovah. Okay? But let me give you a shocker tonight. We are absolutely and completely, without one question of a doubt, in uh, completely uh, indebted to those Masoretic Jews to have the least bit of an idea as to pronounce yod hey vow hey. How do we know we're pronouncing it correctly? The only thing we have to go by are the Masoretic vow points. Here's my point. Hallowed be thy name. Does that mean that God put his name in the Old Testament and said, you'll never know how to pronounce that until you hear me say it? And there it is, all through the Old Testament. Now you hear today, you hear Yahweh. How many heard Yahweh? 
And they say, Yahweh, and put us down as if we're ignorant by saying Jehovah. Folks, I told you the truth. They won't tell you what I just told you. They have no more authority for Yahweh than we have for Jehovah. Okay? No more. And the bottom line is that none of us know exactly how that those uh, four Hebrew, uh, the tetragrammaton, holy name of God, is pronounced. So this is the Lord Jesus saying, Hallowed be thy name. There's a respect we ought to have for the name of God. Shouldn't we? And the respect you have for his name shows what's in your heart. If you love him, you're going to respect his name. You're not going to go around blasting, blaspheming, and, you know, this all day long, and it's and nothing out. Of, and, and today, the F word and all the rest of them that go with it, it's everywhere you turn. It's all over the place. I never heard a filthy mouth crowd in my life like this bunch today. It's amazing. And from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Hallowed be thy name from your heart. So I say, hallowed be thy name. And I agree with that. Amen, amen, amen. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. On Jer in Jericho, there's a road that leads from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Jericho, I think, is the lowest city on earth. I'm not sure, but I know, this, I know the Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth. It's 13, 1,300 feet below sea level at the surface of the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is something like 1,000, 1,300 feet deep. So the lowest point, point on earth, Dead Sea, Jericho's right at it. And it's in a rift. It's in a, like a deep valley. So as you leave Jerusalem and you go south down into Jericho, on the left-hand side, there's a huge gully that comes. And there's a box there. There's a box sticking on the side of the hill. And a man spent 57 years, he was a Greek Orthodox monk, he spent 57 years living in that box on the side of that hill, all right? And uh, it's, got quite a to it's, got, it's got quite a story to it because, you see, the man was on the road to Jericho that fell among thieves. In other words, he was going down from Jerusalem, down to Jericho, and they were waiting on him. And that's where he fell among thieves, was on the road to Jericho. Yes. And the Lord said through this prayer, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, it's called the valley of the shadow of death. Do a, do a Google search on it and type in the valley of the shadow of death, and nine times out of ten it will take you to the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho. You never know what's out there waiting for you. You don't. And you don't know how many times God has protected you and removed the, you know, the, the devil who wanted to destroy you or kick your door down, come into your home or whatever. You don't know. That's why you have to trust your life into his hands. Lord, into thy hands. He said, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Your enemies want to see you fall. And the greatest thing that you can do before your enemies is to rejoice and eat. Sit down at the table and feast from the power of God and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When they see you really rejoicing, it eats them alive. So what we need to do is to come in here and just rejoice unto God this coming Sunday and rejoice up a storm and all of the ones who hate and despise you, uh, <laughs> they won't like it. <laughs> That's right. But let me tell you something. You rejoice in the Lord regardless of whether you feel like it or not. Why? Because he's worthy to be praised. You rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice because he's worthy. Amen. You think about what he did at the cross, and you certainly say that. He said, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. How many of you remember who anointed uh, that uh, shepherd boy, David, son of Jesse, who came to his, uh, this prophet that came to his home and anointed him as the king of Israel? That's right. Somebody said it. Samuel. All right, Hannah's boy, Hannah's boy, Samuel. His name means ask of God, ask of God. And Samuel lived such a life and had such an anointing on him that from Dan to Beersheba, there was not one soul in all of Israel that questioned his credentials. If Samuel said it, it was so. Huh. So when he picked David, well, for, of course, the first one was Saul, but when he picked David and anointed him as the king of Israel, nobody questioned it. 
because he had absolute authority from the Lord. We have been anointed. If you are born again tonight, the Holy Ghost is, uh, has anointed you with an anointing that did not come from this world, which means that just ask God to open your eyes and you can read the Bible. It'll make sense to you. That anointing, we have no need that any man teach us. You remember what it says? Well, if that be true, and it certainly is true, then you should be able to understand the scriptures, folks. Now, there's a, an, another anointing, and one of these is the anointing of the minister, the pastor. Uh, you remember what uh, uh, laying on of hands did? It was a transfer of a power and authority and an anointing. And this is what happens when God calls a young man to preach. Lucas is going to, uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, uh, where are you headed this weekend? Missouri. He just left Kansas, went to North Carolina, and now he's headed back to Missouri. He's been run all over the country. Do you know what that is? That's God opening doors. That's what it is. That's God opening doors. Amen. If he calls you, he will, uh, he, will, he, will, he will prepare you, and then he'll open the door for you. And that's exactly what he's done, uh, because I believe in the call of God to preach. And then David said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And a lot of folks say goodness and mercy are two angels. That's all right. I can't say they're not. Maybe. But they'll follow him all the days of his life. God's been good to me, folks. He really has. He's been real good to me. And uh, I, I sit around sometimes, and I, in the mornings especially. I like to pray in the morning. I like to be out there praying before the sun comes up in the dark. I like to, I like to hear, the little, uh, hear the little birds start singing, and then I'll start singing. Uh, not what you're thinking. I'll start talking to God. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but uh, at night now, the lightning bugs are coming out. How many, how many seen the lightning bugs? Good. That's, that's a good indication you're not glued to your TV, that there's a world outside, right? Yeah, a lightning bug. Did you know that people drive in from all over this country and go up to uh, where Gatlinburg and areas up in there so they can watch, they call them fireflies, lightning bugs, just to see them. So yeah, obviously there are, there are areas around here in the country that don't have lightning bugs. And uh, that's a shame, but we have them here in East Tennessee. And I saw them, and they were bright. I saw them last night in the backyard, the lightning bugs. And I thought, man, I always thank God for stuff like that. I do, I do. I was sitting in my study the other day, and I heard something go off on the side of the house. It sounded like a, it sounded like a 45 Tommy gun. And I thought to myself, and, and, and I, it, I said, that's a woodpecker. He's working on my house. Now I'm all for woodpeckers. I wouldn't shoot a woodpecker unless I, I just know, I, I don't think I could do it. I love woodpeckers. But folks, when they start eating your house up, <laughs> it changes things, doesn't it? But the truth is, I went out the next morning, sat down early in the morning, and, and it, started, it has to get daylight. There's a, there's a certain point. How many of you noticed it? There's a certain point when the light begins to show, then they start singing and everything. Well, this woodpecker started. And I could hear him off over next door. <laughs> <laughs> I thought to myself, whoo, I hope it's not his house he's eating on. Uh, but it's quite a thing. You know what I think about every time I hear a woodpecker? Can you imagine how hard that woodpecker's beak hits that wood? Now, what if your head hits something as hard as that woodpecker did? That brain has to be, it has to be encapsulated in some kind of a sack, some kind of a, you know, absorb, a shock absorbing uh, sack. It, it's almost like the Almighty made him so he'd go out and peck like that, right? Well, of course he did. Of course he did. That's what he does. You know, who wants to kill a poor old woodpecker for doing what he's supposed to do? I grew up watching Woody Woodpecker. How many have any idea who Woody Woodpecker is? All right, good. Mickey Mouse, Roadrunner, all that, yeah. Felix the Cat. And what was the ghost's name? Uh, Casper. Casper the Ghost. Oh, yeah, yeah. Three, and, the, and the Little Rascals and all that. Just good, clean fun for kids to watch. This stuff today, man, there's no telling what they're like. Let me see it. But I get out there with them. Then you hear the dove. You hear the dove off at a distance. It's, it's one of the softest, saddest sounds to hear that dove. And uh, it calls for its mate. And so uh, 
You start listening and you'd be amazed at what's out there. The Lord's blessed us. Amen. He's blessed us. He's blessed every one of us tonight. If I can leave anything with you tonight, I would like to leave this with you. As you leave out of this house tonight, be thankful. Be thankful for what God's done. Be thankful. I see these poor people on the streets, and there's plenty of them out there, plenty of them. I don't look down on them. I pray for them when I see them. And I say to myself, by the grace of God, that's where I'd be. And I wish the best for them. I pray that maybe they can, God will come into their life, turn it around, and they'll, they'll, they'll be able to come off of that. Amen. I don't, I, don't, I don't revel in anybody's sorrow and hurt and pain. There's plenty of it. If you live long enough, you'll know that. Plenty of it to go around. The Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. Father, bless your word tonight. In your holy name I pray. Amen. God bless you, folks. Anybody have a prayer request? <clears throat>